I do these actions and suddenly I feel like a middle-aged white guy. <laughs> We're going to keep the kids in for this morning. Um, you're disappointed, but you get to stay here because we're going to review, basically, our vacation Bible school lessons for the week. But first, let's, uh, let's just take a second to pray. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to come to the Word of God and understand something deeper today. Allow us to see Jesus Christ in a remarkable way. You are good, and we love you. Thank you. Pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So we did get through Vacation Bible School for the week under the under some sons that really did not feel Canadian. I gotta tell you, these were not Alberta temperatures this week. As we tried to do things in plus 30 weather, we didn't really know what to expect this week. We've had a, a couple of years we've done vacation Bible school under COVID conditions with all sorts of the rules and regulations out there. And now all of a sudden everything is let up and people want to be free. They want to travel. They want to do stuff. They don't want to be stuck at home as we have been for two years. So kind of, you know, I know in my heart I was a little worried. Are there any kids in town this week? And the answer was yes, as Clark said, we had 50 plus kids uh, who came out to at least part of the week and uh, had a full house. And we need a big thank you to everybody who was involved in all sorts of different ways because this took a lot of work. And everybody's kind of tired, I gotta be honest with you. Uh, after trying to do the actions, now I only did two and a half songs because I was setting things up for one song. I kind of feel like sitting down and having a nap myself. Um, but for everybody who worked real hard, just a big thank you. We had a unique theme this week. It seems with a lot of vacation Bible schools, the theme these days is usually geographical. It's jungle, or it's desert, or wild west, or, or, or something like that. This year we had a theme that had to do with the creative things. Reflecting how creative a God we have. We spent a week exploring the ideas of, of music and arts and all sorts of, of things that lead us to the fact that we have a God who is creative. And a God who has made us to be creative. Now, I tend to look at myself and say, eh, some of the, the typical art stuff, that's not me. I'm not very, I can't paint or anything like that or draw. If I sing, everybody knows that they cry. It's, however, every one of us has made me creative in some unique ways. And we came to learn this week to appreciate a God who is creative. And today we're going to wrap up Vacation Bible School by reviewing a little bit of what we did with the week. So if you were with us all week and you heard the stories, I was in the back corner over there. We had some dividers up and, and uh, create a little classroom back there. And that's why there's lots of stuff in that particular corner. And uh, I got to tell five stories this week. If you were with us, we're going to kind of review those five stories. If you weren't, well, you get to learn something at Vacation Bible School. Um, today, the title of the sermon, if you look on the back of the bulletin, is mostly based on, on day one. We're not going to stay in day one. We're going to go through all, oh, actually six verses real quick. And you're going to say, hey, Bob. She say there was five days of vacation Bible school. We had six verses. We had one in particular, which was kind of the theme verse for the week, and it was found in Ephesians chapter 2. And if you were with us this week, I had a challenge on Friday. I, I said, close your eyes and try to say the verse. And so you could do that. I'm not. I'm going to be 
honest, I've, remem I've memorized this verse in a couple of different translations, and I'm definitely going to get it wrong. But it basically says this, and I'm going to bite you. If you were with us, try closing your eyes and read it with me. Don't worry if it gets on wrong. And if you weren't with us, you can leave your eyes open, and you can still read with me. Can we do that? We've had an interactive morning so far, so we're going to keep going with interactive. So read with me. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Ephesians 2.10. Okay, you guys did much better at the actions than you did reading along with it. That's okay, we're going to have a couple more verses to go. God is working. He is not far off in the distance. But he is here. He is with us today. He is acting among us. And sometimes we need just to, to slow things down and spend time marveling at our good God and what he does. We've got in this verse that he is prepared for us to do good works. Not, not so we know God. Not so we please God even, which might sound a little funny to say, but because God knows us. And God is pleased with us to bring us into his kingdom. Because God acts, we act. Because God has already done magnificent things, we work in Him. We're not trying to impress God at all. In fact, you know, there is nothing I can do to impress God. But I can be impressed by Him. I can be inspired, empowered, motivated by the glory of God who is working in my midst. God is at work in my life. And so I desire to be on mission with him. Now this week, as we've gone through Vacation Bible School, the, we had a really active group this week. They were full of questions. Every time I looked up, there were like half a dozen hands lifted saying, hey, answer my question, listen to my story. And I, I had to keep telling them. Sometimes we'd hear them. Sometimes I'd have to say, hang on a minute. Because we're tight for time. We're going to have to keep moving along. And we're going to quickly move through our stories this week. So hang on tight as we move through it. We started the week talking about God the Creator on Monday. And Psalm 104, verse 2. And uh, Glenn already read this um, a little bit earlier. I invite you to join with me. How countless... Are your works, Lord? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Psalm 104, verse 2. This was wrapped around the idea of David. David was somebody who gets a lot of press in the Bible. He was somebody who did mighty things. He was a king, even. He was a warrior. Do you know what we might be most amazed by David? Is he was a worshiper. He was somebody who would look out at all that is gone, going on around him. Whether things were happening bad or whether things were going good. Whatever was happening, he would look out at all the world around him and he would see God at work. Because he saw God at work, he responded to God. And so he wrote all of these songs that we find in the Bible. And he responded to a God who did remarkable things, and he celebrated this good God. So God is creator. On day two, we talked about God the designer. And we stayed in in the idea of David. We went to 1 Samuel, and again, join with me as we read these words. Humans do 
not see what the Lord sees. For humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. David. He's a little guy at the beginning of when we see him, we first meet him. There is a, a king at the time, his name is Saul, who is a giant of a man who looks like he is king and acts like a king. He's strong, decisive, and God rejects him. There's a prophet who hears that, that David's family is going to produce the king, so he goes there and he meets the older brothers. He meets a whole lot of older brothers, seven of them. And he keeps looking at them and saying, wow, this one looks like a king. This one acts like a king. This one talks like a king. And God keeps saying, no. Until finally David comes in. The shepherd, the guy who spends time with sticky sheep. The little guy, the youngest, the runs of the living. And God comes to this verse to the prophet. His name is Samuel. Tells him this verse. Do you know what? We tend to judge what we can see. So that's all we know. But we have a God who has designed us in incredible ways that we can't even judge, that we can't even understand. God, the designer, is at work. It is David who gets selected as king. On Wednesday, we jumped forward like a, a, a thousand years in history. David was, was a one time in history, but we come to the New Testament to find Jesus, the King. Now this verse that I'm about to bring up that we're going to read seems really kind of out of place for reading it on a hot August week. Because it's going to be a verse that you're going to look at and you're going to think, hey, this is something we typically do in March and April. Because that's to do with Palm Sunday. But let's come to a, a particularly important verse out of gospel, the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to invite you again to read with me. And this one, you can read a little louder because as we do it, we're going to discover that this is one that gets shouted at the time. So try to go a little louder. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Matthew 21, 9b. Hosanna. And I'm going to tell you right away, we got to stop there, don't we? Because Hosanna, what kind of word is that? Clearly, this isn't a typical English word. It's related to, it's actually kind of, make it sound more pronounceable, but it's it, it's from a Hebrew word, which basically means save us. And there's big crowds that have gathered around as Jesus is coming into the, the main city of the country, Jerusalem. Jesus is coming in and sends his disciples, a couple of anyways, to get him a donkey. And he rides in. And as he's coming in, the people, now, we typically do it that we grab palm branches and we wave them. It says more in the Gospels that they laid them on the ground as he's coming in. And it, it's like he's coming in on a red carpet. They've laid out a red carpet for him to come in. And the people are yelling out this. Hosanna, save us! And they're yelling these things out because they, they know there's something wrong. The world isn't the way it's supposed to be. It seems like a lot of stuff is a mess and a struggle and, and things just aren't going the way they are. So they start yelling out, save us. And they have this this idea that maybe maybe Jesus is going to come in and he's going to 
He's going to chase out the, the Roman government and he's going to become the king that they, they dream of. A perfect king, uh, a perfect government. That's going to fix everything. But there's a problem with their life. They're yelling out, save us. But what they needed to understand that crowd is the problem wasn't out there somewhere. The problem was in their life. It was in their hearts. That there is a thing that the Bible calls sin. It is the wrong things we've done that have turned our backs on God. And because we do wrong, because I do wrong, because I mess up, I'm part of the problem in this world. And when Jesus comes as king, he's coming not just king forever, he's coming as king for me. That my heart needs to be changed. That my life needs to be different. We have a remarkable king who does things different than we may expect. Fact. We are usually with us on Sunday mornings. We're going to have a communion Sunday next Sunday. The week after that, we're going to hit September. Oh, it's hard to believe we're almost in September, isn't it? But there are starting to be a few yellow leaves out there and things like that. So we're heading there. Uh, Zoe went into school a little bit this week, so I know s s summer is coming to an end. We're going to be in September, and we're going to start a new sermon series at the beginning of September called Unexpected. And it's about how God deals with us in unexpected ways sometimes. Well, this crowd is going to get an unexpected king. They want him to put a, a, a crown on his head and ride around his king and and overthrow the bad guys, he's going to wear a crown. But it's going to be a very different crown. Because that's what we come to in our Thursday lesson. Jesus, the Redeemer. And Redeemer is kind of a, a big word, kind of a, a little bit of a different word these days. But the idea is he's the one who comes to buy us. And it's God's plan all along. Jesus dies on the cross. And I put the verse behind me. We're going to read it in a minute. It's part way through the story. Jesus goes to the cross and he dies there. And he doesn't just die there. Do according to the Bible, my sin. Those things that I said that are wrong, those, those things that are mistakes in my life, they're also on the cross with Jesus. They're gone. They're dead. They're taken care of. But it doesn't just sit there. Jesus dies on the cross. But you know it says in the Bible that it, that happens on Friday. Everybody gets up Sunday morning. And, and we're told a, a couple of ladies go and see where they laid them down. And they get there. And they find the stone rolled away and they find a couple of angels. To tell them, he's risen from the dead. And they, they run back and they start telling the disciples and everybody's all excited. And the disciples run to the tomb and they look around and they're all confused. Well, later that day, a couple of disciples we don't have the names for are going along on this journey. They're walking along, and, and, and as they're walking down the road, somebody's standing with them all of a sudden, walking with them. And they don't recognize it. It's actually Jesus. And Jesus asks them, well, what's going on? And they say, what do you mean what's going on? Are you the only person in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on? We have Jesus who last week rode into the city as a king and then we, we put him up on a cross and he died and now we're hearing stories that he's alive. 
And Jesus doesn't reveal who he is, but he starts telling them, well, yeah, obviously, have you never read the Bible? The Bible says it's going to happen. In fact, and again, you can read with me the verse on the screen. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Luke 24, 46. This is what was written. Now, I immediately, of course, asked the kids, where is it written? And the answer is it's written in the Bible. This is what's going to happen. We need a king who is willing to give himself up for us, who is willing to die and rise again for us. You see, this whole rising again is important. He dies on the cross, and our sin, my sin, goes up on the cross with Jesus. And I'm pointing towards this cross as partially covered by our pain now, although the pain seems to be slipping. It was up on but my sin went up on the cross with Jesus, but it, you know what? This wasn't Jesus' ultimate fate. And it's not my ultimate fate either. Because just as Jesus rose from the dead, it says in the Bible that I rise with him, that I have new life with Jesus. That everything has changed because Jesus died and rose again. Everything has become different now. On Thursday, we have a little arts thing that I gave out to the kids. And uh, I was going to bring it up with me, but it's so small, nobody can be able to see it from where you are. It was basically a little tiny piece of paper like this with a, a picture in it. You were supposed to draw a stick man version of yourself. We wanted to really say that this is about me. I forgot to mention a minute ago when we did Palm Sunday, you'll see a bunch of faces in the back there. Uh, some of the kids took their faces home, so they're not all there anymore, but we want to say that as the people were calling out Hosanna, save us, that it needs to be us out there calling out, save us. And so we joined the crowd. We were part of the crowd that was calling it out. Well, not only is that true for that, it's true this Thursday lesson of Jesus dying and rising me. And so had the kids draw a stickman figure, and the stickman took different shapes. They might put on the shape a stickman that kind of is just standing there. That basically was saying, okay, I've heard what you said about Jesus dying and rising again, but I'm not ready to deal with this yet. We might put up two hands like this and say, do you know what? Yeah, I've heard this message of Jesus dying and rising again. I'm with him. This is me. I have accepted Jesus already. I put up one side and say, I, feel, I hear this message of Jesus dying and rising again. But I have questions. I don't fully get it. We talk about this stuff. And I've got a, a couple of kids to follow up with through the next couple of weeks. I might do the other side. Let's say, you know what? I hear what you're saying, that Jesus died and rose again. And that's got to be me. I need my sin to go on the cross, and I need this new life. And I need it now. And I tell you, for anyone who's here, follows into that category of, I need to ask questions. Or, I need to know Jesus. Why don't you stick around after church? Go to a friend. I'd love to pray with you.
talk about things. Because we have a remarkable Savior. With one more lesson. Friday we talked about the Holy Spirit, the help. You see, after Jesus rises from the dead, for about 40 days, Jesus is wandering around with them occasionally getting together. They do all their usual stuff. Life goes back to really good. They get some teaching, they have some meals together, do all sorts of stuff, and it's, it's great because Jesus is standing right beside them. I mean, for, for centuries, when you wanted to know about God, you'd, you'd just you'd pick up the Bible or you'd talk to somebody and they would tell you about how God was up there. Well, now all of a sudden, God was walking beside me. And boy, did it feel good. But then all of a sudden, as they're going around, Jesus says, well, it's time for me to leave. Bye. And they're kind of stunned. Hold on, it's been so good. Jesus has been right beside us, walking alongside us. What do you mean you're leaving? And they stand around stunned. Until they realize there's some angels standing with them. And in Acts chapter 1, come to our final verse. The ones to click ahead. There we go. So I invite you to read with me. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1 8. They're probably standing there as these angels say this, saying, what is this talking about? So they, they spend a few days doing their thing, and they come to a special holiday in the Hebrew calendar called Pentecost, and they gather together, and all of a sudden, everything kind of goes funny. They start talking. And they start talking in languages they don't know at all. Imagine if I got up and just started preaching this sermon in, oh, I don't know what language. What was that? I heard somebody yell something out. Aramaic. Aramaic. Actually, we're not going to pick Aramaic because I actually know a little Aramaic. <laughs> um, I don't know very much, but there's a little piece of the Bible actually written in that language. Let's, let's just say, I don't know, um, Spanish. I don't know much Spanish. If I started preaching that language, and all of you started understanding me in that language. It's kind of like that, and it said there was, it was like there was fire above their heads, and, and they get up and they start preaching to huge crowds of people. Thousands of people. And thousands come to believe in Jesus, and all of a sudden they realize, oh, we've got something better than Jesus walking along beside us. You know what? In the Gospels, it actually says that we are better if Jesus goes up to the Father and sends the Holy Spirit to us. Because now, all of a sudden, God lives within us. And I asked all three groups to come through to, for uh, story time on Friday. Where does God live? And everybody's first answer is immediately heaven. And immediately my response can be no. Yeah, he can be there. But he actually lives within me. He lives in my life. He's in my heart. And he empowers me to do remarkable things. He changes everything for me. That's my Savior. Today, we can know something of this God. The God who is our creator. The God who designs us uniquely to do remarkable things. 
Jesus, our King. The one who comes to save us. And Jesus, our Redeemer, who comes to save us. The Holy Spirit, our Helper, who's in our lives. This really is an overview of the entire Christian message in a quick few moments. I like this curriculum that we did this week. So many of the curriculums are scared to say that we are sinners. I don't want to just kind of make us all feel good about ourselves. This one wasn't afraid. Say something that I think we need to be able to say. There is something wrong in the human condition. And we need to understand that there is indeed a problem. I need absolutely to be part of the crowd that yells out, save us. I need to be able to yell that every day to join with that crowd. The Bible teaches that I need to admit that yes, indeed, I am a sinner. That I need absolutely to believe in Jesus and to commit myself to follow him. It changes everything. For any of us, kids, adults, you are in a place where you need to ask questions or you just need to come in prayer before Jesus and say, I am a sinner, I believe, I want to follow you. moments, we're going to sing one more VBS song, and then I'm going to come up and, and read one last little piece of scripture, but you are invited afterwards to come up and pray. For everyone else, you can grab a cup of coffee, start taking decorations down. If you stay long enough, taking down decorations will even give you a hot dog, actually, because <laughs> we have some hot dogs. But if you need to do business with God, that's priority one. That's what matters. So, Mark and Tamara and the teams who are leading with the actions, if you want to come, and we're going to do one more. Jared looks a little reluctant. Come on up.